Hey there, I'm Matt Easton of Scholar Gladiatoria. I'm a historical fencing instructor, antique arms dealer, and I'm looking at the five worst movie swords. Let's be more specific about that. Historically worst, it doesn't mean to say they're necessarily bad swords in themselves or bad props, or indeed that the movies were bad or the fighting was bad or anything else. I'm simply looking at the most inappropriate, historically, swords found in five movies which I could find. Very often what we find with movies is that, generally speaking, the swords or the weapons, even armour, shown within a movie can be pretty historically accurate or more or less historically accurate. Whether we're looking at Pirates of the Caribbean or Gladiator, we can find a general look which generally looks okay and most of the stuff is okay. But very often we'll find that heroes or major characters, because the director wants them to stand out from the other from the other more or less historically correct um, people in the movie, they're often given things which are odd or strange or large or stand out in some way. And that's what we see in these examples which follow. We find that particular swords just don't fit within that historical period, or indeed within any historical period in some cases. First up we have the 1995 film Braveheart. Braveheart is a, a very popular choice for critics of his, uh, historical movies because quite fundamentally it's full of horrible errors and terrible things. But anyway, um, there is one thing which stands out in the movie of Braveheart and that is Braveheart's own sword. It stands out like a sore thumb because generally speaking a fair amount of the equipment shown in the film Braveheart, I, I'm sure that historians will be shouting at me here, but a fair amount of it is approximately historically correct. So what is historical? Well, Braveheart was set, generally speaking, we're looking at the life of William Wallace here. So William Wallace died in 1305. Um, the Battle of Stirling Bridge, for example, was in 1297. So we're looking at arms and equipment around the year 1300. Whilst Mel Gibson portraying William Wallace himself is shown with various different weapons throughout the movie and in fact obviously we see his troops and the people he fights with and against holding or using many different types of um, weapons. The, the weapon which um, stands out most significantly as, as his weapon is this large two-handed sword. Now there's no question that the reason that the uh, directors and the writers decided to give him this large two-handed sword was because there is a famous sword in in Scotland which is attributed to William Wallace. However, that is almost certainly not the sword of William Wallace. Um, experiments have shown that it is in fact made of um, three bits of metal um, in the blade which may come from three old swords, we don't know, but certainly this style of sword just simply wasn't around in the year 1300. And you might be saying, oh maybe it had a new hilt, maybe this is a, a 16th or 17th century hilt that's been added on according to the style of it, um, but it doesn't seem that the blade is original either. But what's kind of ironic is the people making the movie decided to give him a large two-handed sword, but it is not the sword as featured um, in, in the Wallace sword that survives today, although you could say that I suppose that the blade could be somewhat similar and they decided to put a hilt which looked slightly more believable on it. But is that hilt believable? Well, no. Every element of it, perhaps apart from the grip, I suppose, but you could say the grip's too long for this period. Um, the pommel is just completely wrong for this period. The crossguard's wrong. The leather covering on the ricasso is wrong. Essentially, this is a kind of fantasy sword. There's no real analogue for, for a sword like this existing in history. If we took the leather off the ricasso, we could say it's approximately a late 15th or mid to late 15th century sword. But then, of course, that puts it at least 150 years later than Wallace's own life. So we can say without any shadow of a doubt that this sword is just completely wrong for Braveheart. I understand why they put it in there, but historically it's complete rubbish. Um, and even just as a sword, even if it was in a movie set in the year 1500, it wouldn't be right either. It just doesn't really look like any historical examples that we know of. Next up we have 1961's El Cid, starring Charlton Heston. In many ways this has parallels with Braveheart from 1995. Undoubtedly Braveheart was partly inspired by movies like El Cid. Who was El Cid historically? Well, he was Rodrigo Diaz de Viva, who lived from around 1043 to 1099. So we're looking at the 11th century here. Think the Battle of Hastings. Think of William the Conqueror. Think of the Bayer Tapestry. Yet what we see in the movie is very different to uh, images we see from the Bayer Tapestry and, and the, what we would expect to see in the Battle of Hastings with that level of technology. 
they clearly wanted to create a movie which was set during the, the higher Middle Ages with more classically medieval symbology. So we see knights with bits of plate armour and lifting visors and lances with handguards sitting on jousting horses. El Cid is a strange example in that, generally speaking, they get some of the weapons and the look of the period kind of correct, but there is an awful lot to criticise there. And the swords are no exception to that. There are in fact three of El Cid's swords which are so drastically out of period and so starkly against the, when it's supposed to be set, that being the 10 hundreds or the 11th century. And the first and probably most striking example is the Tizona sword, which in fairness is based on an actual sword which is in Spain and which is believed to have been owned by El Cid. But quite simply, the hilt of it is in the style of the late 15th century, possibly the 16th century. And so quite simply, El Cid cannot have owned this sword in the way that we see it today. Some people may argue that the blade may have been re-hilted and indeed the blade may have been part of a sword that belonged to El Cid. I personally find this dubious, but nevertheless, the fact is that the sword would not have looked like that in the 10 hundreds because they simply didn't have hilts that looked like this. Next up, we occasionally see um, El Cid Rodrigo going around with what's essentially a side sword, a 16th century side sword, which is easily noticed by all of its elaborate sidebars, which give extra hand protection. And in the 16th century, when people started wearing swords more regularly in civilian life, and indeed the culture of dueling started to um, expand, we do indeed see swords like side swords and rapiers develop with more hand protection, but they were not around in the 11th century. Having a 16th century sword in the 11th century, that is 500 years, 500 years, half a millennium. That, that's like seeing a car in, in a movie about Henry VIII. And finally, we see two large two-handed swords used in what is, quite frankly, one of movie's greatest duels, probably. And it is an absolutely fantastic fight. And you know what? I love the movie El Cid. And as a kid, I absolutely adored it. I didn't care about the um, historic, historically correct nature of it. But the fact is that these types of two-handed swords, yet again, don't really, aren't really seen until the late 15th century and really the 16th century. And these swords are very clearly modelled on two-handed swords from the 16th century. So again, we have 16th century swords in an 11th century setting, 500 years different. Next up is 2006's 300 or the 300 depending on how you want to call it and uh, you know quite simply we have to admit straight off that this is based on the 1998 comic series by Frank Miller and so therefore it is to a certain degree we could say it's a bit fantasy it's certainly based on graphic novel but nevertheless it is also based on a true event that happened at the Battle of Thermopylae um, during the Persian Wars in 480 BC. Now, generally speaking, the most noticeable thing about this movie is the lack of armour. Why are the Spartans so naked? Um, they do seem to like their little um, their pants and not wearing much else, which, you know, we'll leave that aside. This is, this is a video about swords. Now, there is one particular sword uh, that I want to pick up on. And that is the sword of King Leonidas, played by Gerard Butler, of course. Now, what is that strange sword he's holding? Well, before we go into that, I think we need to admit straight off that most of the soldiers, most of the Spartans, do correctly use swords which look more or less like the Xiphos. The Xiphos was the double-edged, straight, pointed um, weapon. You could say almost it was like an early um, predecessor of the Roman gladius. And indeed, they do use swords um, which are somewhat like the Xiphos, so I'm not going to criticise those. But the sword that Leonidas himself uses is very clearly supposed to be a coppice or falcata. However, the actual form of it, as it's represented in the movie, really looks quite different to a, to a coppice or a falcata. As you can see here with these original examples, there is a very characteristic shape, which it has to be said is somewhat similar to a later Ottoman yatagan, or indeed like a scaled up version of the Gurkha Kukri. The characteristic features being a forward recurved blade, 
with a form of curved around pommel that sort of curves up over the little fingers and um, a rudimentary handguard. Now all of those features are indeed present on Leonidas's sword but they just kind of got the shape wrong and you know I accept it is based on a graphic novel so it does, it is supposed to have a different look to it, so I'm not going to dwell on this one. But nevertheless, just so that you're aware, this is not really what an actual original coppice or falcata really looks like. Next up we have that famous scene from 1981's Raiders of the Lost Ark, featuring Indiana Jones against the Swordsman. And the um, small piece of trivia, originally this scene, um, he famously pulls out the, the revolver and shoots the swordsman. Originally he was supposed to use his whip to disarm the swordsman. It was Harrison Ford's own idea to just pull his revolver out. Um, but that swordsman, what on earth is that sword that he's waving around? Well, quite simply, it seems to be a sort of Disney version of a scimitar. Um, it looks like something that's come straight out of a 1940s Disney Prince of Persia type Aladdin film. I'm not really sure where they got the idea that this um, swordsman should be armed with this type of giant falchion and actually that's the point. What he's actually waving around looks far more like a medieval European falchion than anyth anything that would have been used in the Middle East at this time. In actual fact that clipped point is very characteristic of European falchions and when we look at medieval manuscripts often the um, set during the Crusades or uh, showing events that happened during the Crusades. Very often the Crusaders are shown with this fictionalised idea of what the Islamic world were using as swords, but in fact they weren't. And um, if we look at this sword, for example, that belonged to the um, Ottoman ruler Mehmet the Conqueror, conqueror of Constantinople, um, you can see that in indeed it does have a sort of raised false edge known as a yelman. Um, however, this is a very different shape to this sort of falchion or clipped back almost like a giant bowie knife type shape that for some reason 19th century and 20th century um, fiction has got into its head is the type of sword or the type of scimitar that was used in the Middle East and North Africa at this time. It simply wasn't. Um, so quite simply he's holding yet again a fantasy sword. This is not a sword really that this type of character would have been using against Indiana Jones. And fifth and finally to finish off, one of my teenage favourite films, Robin Hood Prince of Thieves from 1991. And it has to be said that whilst the armour and costume is fairly terrible for the 1190s when this is supposed to be set, most of the swords featured in the movie are actually not too bad. They are one-handed, what we would call arming swords with approximately 12th century-ish hilts on them. So they look kind of more or less okay. However, there are two particular swords which really stand out as incorrect for the 1190s. One being Robin's father's sword and the other being Azim or Morgan Freeman's sword. Now we have to acknowledge of course that Robin Hood is probably fantasy to some degree but nevertheless it's set within a historical period. It's very definitely set in the 1190s. We know that because at the end of the Third Crusade we see Richard the Lionheart, we have King John, we know it's very much established within a historical period. Now we must also admit that previous versions of Robin Hood have been equally historically incorrect, especially in regards to the swords. Um, very commonly with old versions of Robin Hood, they used very narrow bladed swords that made it easier for the actors to do the type of stage fencing based on sabre fencing that they were familiar with. So we should at least give credit where credit's due. Robin Hood Prince of Thieves does more or less show most of the medieval swords in roughly the right proportions and shapes for what they should be for the end of the 12th century. However, these two swords really stand out. Robin's father's sword is what we would call a long sword. It's a two-handed sword. Now, that's not to say that two-handed swords absolutely didn't exist in the 1190s. They were probably just about starting to appear in this sort of proportion uh, with this kind of hand and a half hilt as we would call it. However, they certainly didn't become um, common until 100 years later at the very least. And this particular shape of sword that's being um, held here by the Sheriff of Nottingham is very much a 14th century design, all, although we have to say with a very strange pommel, the pommel being in the form of a hollow cross. I don't know of any historical swords which really have pommels like that, but if we ignore that and assume that it was a solid wheel pommel or just, this was just a unique example, 
The proportions of the hilt, the style of the blade, the taper of the blade, the style of the cross guard. Um, generally speaking, we would say that this was a late 14th century um, sword. So, you know, we're talking about um, 200 years too far in the future. So this sword very much doesn't really belong in this movie. Although, once again, I do understand why they put it in there. It's a hero sword, it has to stand out, it has to look different from the other swords. So I do understand it from a movie making point of view. But the sword in Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves that really stands out from the others is Azim's sword. It's very clearly been designed to stand out and it's supposed to look exotic and foreign and presumably Middle Eastern. But yet again, we've got this Prince of Persia, Aladdin, sort of fake fantasy Middle Eastern style scimitar that doesn't seem to have any place in actual history. Perhaps the only bit of this sword, which really seems historical, ironically, is not the sword, it's the scabbard. The scabbard, you might think, how does that scabbard function? With such a broad blade, how do you draw the blade out of the scabbard? But we see that it has a slot in the top. Well, this is actually historical. We see that many, um, for example, Ottoman Turkish um, Kilic swords do in fact have a slot at the top so that you can draw out a broader ended blade. But the sword itself seems to be pure fantasy. It's an extremely curved blade with a very strangely shaped clipped point. I can't really think of, of a blade that that could be modelled on. Certainly from this period and this region. And the hilt equally is really quite bizarre and at first sight looks almost like certain styles of Indian hilt or Nepalese. For example, if we look at the Nepalese Kora, the Nepalese Kora fundamentally has a similar hilt to this, but not really in these proportions and not with such thick, chunky guard and pommel. But the overall combination of the hilt and the blade are just really bizarre and I can only imagine that the prop designer wanted to have something that not only looked a bit Middle Eastern but looked a bit African and maybe they took a conscious decision um, in order to put Morgan Freeman's character within, within the movie to almost give him his own weapon which didn't really look specifically like the weapon of any particular other culture. So there we have it. Thank you very much for watching. These are five of the movies containing the most bizarre or historically incorrect swords that I can think of. If you can think of other movies which feature equally wrongly placed weapons, swords or any other type of weapon in fact, then feel free to post below and maybe I'll do a follow up video at some point in the future. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe. We have extra videos on Patreon and you can follow us on Facebook.